What is happening everybody? It is Trey here, joined again by Sean with another great edition of Reactions to the Classics. This time we are going to be reviewing the Rolling Stones classic album, Let It Bleed. This will be our second Stones review. Yeah. We went over Beggar's Banquet, which is the first time we ever listened to the Stones in a full album format. Really thought that was a tremendous yeah, record. great, man. Great. And so uh, just moving on in their uh, chronological a release and Let It Bleed's next. So uh, this is our first time listening to that. Yeah. Really excited. And if this is your first time joining the channel, thank you so much for stopping by. Here are reactions to the classics. We review classic albums in a track-by-track -track format and give you a really detailed review. And most of the time, it is a first time listen from us. All that to say, man, let's get into some quick facts. Let's do it, man. This thing was released in December of 1969. It's the eighth UK album, the 10th album released in the U.S. Mm -hmm. for the Stones. Uh, all the songs were written by Jagger and, and Richards as normal, except for Love and Vain, which was written by Robert Johnson, which we'll get into in a little bit. And this bad boy is number 32 on the Rolling Stones' top 500 albums of all time. And the interesting thing on this one, Trey, is Brian Jones, the founder of the Rolling Stones, yeah. was still around at this time, but he's coming into the studio high, drunk. He only appears on two of the tracks, actually firing during the recording of this mm -hmm. album, and he dies a month after they fire him. They bring in Mick Taylor to replace him. The principal recording was almost all the way done. Uh, Keith Richards had to do most of the guitar work all the way around. So Mick Taylor's only on two of those songs as well. He does overdubs uh, afterwards. They really were experimenting a little bit, kind of had some eclectic arrangements yeah. in the 60s. Uh, they went from kind of, uh, I was reading the psychedelic from their Satanic Majesty's Request. Then you had Beggar's Banquet, which had some different styles. Yeah. And this album features the slide guitar a bunch. A so bunch. it has a, a very bluesy feel I noticed throughout the entire record. So that brings us into the first song, Gimme Shelter, very yeah, famous man. song. Rolling Stones has the 38th greatest song of all time, it's never even released as a single. Uh, Mick talks about this, about the Vietnam War. Vietnam War is a very difficult time mm -hmm. during this time in 1969. A lot of violence, not many people felt good about the Vietnam War. He talked about how it was different than World War II and that just, there was a lot of controversy over it. However, as often as the case when you go back and look at these things, Keith has a different take on it. Yeah, he said that originally this was just about getting shelter from a, a literal storm. storm. Yeah, but uh, you know, I think you can obviously read the interpretation during that tumultuous time. Yeah. I can only imagine just how crazy it would have been. But man, the song itself, I'm going to say the Stones really know how to start off a record. Oh yeah, it's great. From Sympathy for the Devil and uh, the Beggar's Banquet. To this man, it just I, I thought this song was just tremendous. One of my favorites I've heard from the Stones by far. And this is my favorite on the entire record, man. They just started this out with a bang. Just the vocals and energy here just just really like struck a chord with yeah. me. Especially Mary Clayton's of the vocals where she's just uh, shouting, it's just a shot away. It's very similar <laughs> to uh, Pink Floyd, great gig. In the yeah, sky. no, I'd with, agree. With the female. It's the most a female is, is featured on any Rolling Stone mm -hmm. songs ever. And it's crazy because she was very, very pregnant as they described it. They got her out of bed, called her up. She comes in the studio at midnight, lays down two tracks, goes back home, and she has a miscarriage. That's a tragic part of the story, obviously. And they, they attribute it, many people do, to her intense singing on yeah, the song. Yeah, just belting it out. Yeah, I don't know if that's why it happened, but it's kind of crazy. After that banger to start with, we go into Love in Vain. This was originally written by blues legend and uh, just overall music legend Robert Johnson, very popular in the 30s. Yeah, I was going to say, written way back in the 30s. Yeah, and I know he had a big influence on some of the founders of rock and roll, and uh, this actually led to a lawsuit in the early 2000s from Johnson's estate. But uh, man, I, I thought this was good. Kind of reminded me again of Beggar's Banquet, how they went from uh, you know a, a crazy rock and yeah. opener to no expectations here. We got a, a nice kind of acoustic, bluesy type song, and I just thought it was very, uh, very good. And uh, Mick, I like the way he used his vocals to make it his own. Yeah, I agree. It just kind of takes you, yeah, you know, as you said, from Give Me Shelter, something that's kind of banging into this mm -hmm. song. Uh, it's really the closest you mentioned acoustic blues that. So just like down home blues yeah, and the stones would ever achieve. Grassroots. They, they were obviously going for it on this album, which takes us right into Country Honk. Now Country Honk is the country version of Honky Tonk Woman, one of their most famous songs. 
Honky Tonk Woman was released five months before this album was released. They were supposed to be released at the same time, but this album had a ton of delays. So Country Honk is how that song was supposed to be. So it's an interesting inclusion. Much more country, no pun yeah. intended, uh, in this song. I liked it. It's, you know, Mix just talking about all the women that he's come across yeah. in these Honky Tonk bars. Yeah, and Jackson, you know. Yeah, down in Jackson. Yeah, I like this. And again, you know, I my... Uh, you know, preconceptions about the Stones was just, you know, they're kind of just like a rock band. But here with the first three oh, songs, yeah. I'm Way seeing different. that they have a wide range of styles, which kind of surprised me and uh, showed off their musical talents, the way they were able to incorporate a bunch of different instruments and stuff. And here, uh, I like the country vibe too. It's something I didn't expect, but overall, <laughs> I enjoyed it, man. Agreed. Then that takes us into Live With Me. This was the first song recorded with Mick Taylor, as you mentioned in the opening. Yeah a new guitarist and this is kind of a, a unique song in the sense that uh, Jagger's just talking about how this guy wants this this woman to live with him because he kind of needs a woman's touch to to help around the house but in his house there's uh, some crazy cooks I think he calls her a whore and, yeah uh, yeah there's you know there's like a, a stripper there and all this other uh, wild stuff in his home but uh, he still invites uh, the, the woman to be with him so uh, this was probably in the in the bottom tier for me but uh, uh, all in all, I, I still thought it was a, a solid effort. Yeah, I think it was my least favorite song on mm -hmm. here, but I still liked it. I mean, I don't really have a least favorite, but if you made me pick one, it'd be yeah. this. And yeah, I agree with you. It was fine. It's a fine song. It kind of jumps into the next song, the title track, yeah. What It Bleeds. Same kind of thing. A lot of sexual overtones in this album, which is common with the Stones, common with Mick in particular. Yeah. <laughs> this has this song in particular has a lot of sexual and a lot of drug use mm -hmm. stuff, you know? Talking about the junkie nurse, cocaine, yeah. and just a ton of other sexual yeah. stuff that I really won't quite get into. But it's a really, really good song, though, man. Great vocal performance. Instrumentation is tremendous on it. Really like it. Yeah, I, I agree with you there, Sean. This one grew on me a, a bit. Uh, and it's, uh, again, Mick, I, I wouldn't say he's like, like a, a knockdown uh, traditional vocalist, but he has a wide range and ability to uh, like change his voice. It's kind of reminded me from again Beggar's Bank with the Dear Doctor. Yeah, he's he, trying to twang it up a little yeah. bit. Yeah, he, he specifically sings. Yeah, in a he's like you can uh, lean on me. Yeah, 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 he's trying. I, I thought it was cool, and the lyrical themes was, was interesting too. And what you get in a lot of relationships, kind of that uh, dichotomy between um, you know the emotional support and the physical yeah. you know lust and so that that was on display here and you know have somebody that uh, you know you can bleed on essentially and, yeah. and give yourself to so uh, uh, this was one of my favorites agreed then that takes us into the midnight rambler don't let him get you Sean yeah I'll try I, to stay away I, I will say that this was written by uh, Richards and Jagger when they were in Italy yeah, and they were on vacation and they're like this great place so it's kind of weird to write a song yeah. about this, and but. this is based pretty much off the Boston Strangler. Yeah, Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler. Yeah. That's what this song is about. Yeah, and this thing, man, it was long. It was, Richards described it kind of as a, a, what, a blues opera? Yeah, he said it was a quintessential, their quintessential songwriting accomplishment, mm -hmm. and then no one else could have written this song yeah. but them, but yeah. yeah and a, uh, it, it was very interesting. You had a bunch of tempo shifts in here, some great harmonica work that Jagger actually yeah, really was, was on, and uh, I just thought it was a, one of my favorite songs I, I liked the way it was arranged like the the lyrical imagery and story that was being told about uh, this guy coming in the night you better shut your doors he's gonna get you he's gonna take you out and it, it goes from uh, like a stranger to a gambler then to the rambler yeah, it progresses and, through the different verses yeah I think it's a really good storytelling and I think the instrumentation on it and the composition and <laughs> arrangement is tremendous so yeah I think this song kind of has all aspects of what you're looking for. I try to take this up to You Got the Silver, mm -hmm. which is actually Keith Richards on lead vocals. He'd sang vocals with Mick on a few songs where they kind of shared lead vocals. This is the first time he's ever by himself. Yeah, just go front and center for one. Yeah. yeah, and he wrote it about his then girlfriend, Anita Powenberg, who was <laughs> with Brian Jones before that. And there were two different versions of this song recorded. Yeah, so the one on the album, of course, has Richards, but they also recorded an alternate mix with Jagger on vocals, and that is the last appearance of Brian Jones, who plays the auto harp. Yeah, he's only on that one, so he's not actually on the album. But I will tell you, that version is out there if you just search for it. Mm -hmm. I listen to it. I actually prefer this version much more. Yeah. I actually like Keith's vocals much more. It's a different arrangement when Jagger does it. It sounds fine, but 
I actually really, really enjoyed this song. Yeah, I did too, and it's, I think, the shortest track on the record. It is. It comes in under three minutes. I just thought it was a, a good talent here by, by Richard showing off the, the vocals a little bit. So all in all, good for me. Then we go into the second to last track, Monkey Man, and this thing started off pretty cool with that piano. Yeah, and yeah, it's got a piano, it's got a vibraphone, it's got bass, yeah, guitar, yeah, a bunch of different, all of it. Bunch started. of different instruments yet again, so the Stones showing off their musical prowess and yeah I just thought it was a, a pretty cool upbeat type of song and uh, what were the lyrics about John? Well the lyrics are just kind of about the take that everybody had on the Stones mm -hmm. that they were they Mick and, and Keith had just gotten acquitted of drug charges so it kind of talks about how they're on drugs and their sexual yeah. exploitations and it's just kind of almost a mocking of just like this is what you think we are but we're really Some not people like hope you're not a, a touch too satanic or whatever because yeah. of their you know previous album and you know sympathy for the devil and whatnot so i thought it was kind of a unique take uh to go at kind of some of the critics who were coming at them yeah i thought it was really good all right trey we're up to the final song you can't always get what you want and this thing is just tremendous it's ranked number 100 on the 500 best songs of all time by Rolling Stone, mm -hmm. one of my personal top probably 20 songs. Um, the single version is only five minutes. The album version much better. Yeah, because it has the London Bach Choir exactly. in there. Exactly. The first minute of the song is the London Bach Choir. It just adds this, this beauty to the song. Uh, the song is kind of about a political statement of the times, love, politics. Mm -hmm. It takes you from the disillusion into kind of the positivity that ends up coming out of things. And basically, the whole uh, gist of the song is that, you know, you don't always get what you want, but you end up getting what you need. And that's exactly. kind of what happens in life. We think we want this, mm -hmm. but we end up getting what we need. And it's not usually the same thing. No, and I, I thought it just has a great message, as you just said. Yeah. I, I just think it's uh, interesting in life. It got me thinking about my own life. Like, okay, I wanted this to happen and this to happen. You know, life had a different path. I went a different way, but at the end of the day, I'm content with where I'm at. Exactly. I got what I needed and all that stuff uh, made me the person who I am today. So I just thought this was an amazing song. Definitely one of the top three songs I've heard so far from the, the Stones. One of the best, obviously, on the album. Probably one of the best closing tracks on any album ever. Yeah, I and would agree with that. I, I just thought it built up great and just the, from the lyrics to the, the choir in there, just the instrumentation as a whole. I just thought this is a classic song that deserves its status. Yeah, it's brilliant. Brilliant. So that kind of brings us into what are your favorite tracks? Well, for me, it would uh, be Gimme Shelter would be at the top, man. I just think that's such a banger, so much energy uh, and just fire within it. And then you can't always get what you want. Midnight Rambler would be number three for me. And uh, I, I really liked Love and Vain too. Thought it was a little underrated, just nice acoustic blues. Yeah, I'm going to go with You Can't Always Get What You Want at one. Uh, Give Me Shelter at two. Mm -hmm. You Got the Silver, Keith, my Ooh. man, at three. Ooh, I like it. Then Let It Bleed at four, which takes us into the overall mm -hmm. score of this album. What'd you give it? Well, I, on Beggar's Banquet, I gave that an 8.75. If you asked me today, I'd actually bump that up to a nine. And I this, probably would, too. Yeah, and this, I'm going to settle at a very solid eight and a half. I thought this album was great, man. Uh, it took a little bit to grow on me just because, you know, the, the bluesy sound, it's not what I listen to a lot in life, but once I got used to it, I started to really appreciate it. Appreciated all the musical arrangements and uh, differentiation in, in songs throughout the record. So I thought this album was great, man. What about you, Sean? I gave it an 825, mm -hmm. probably an 825 to an 85 yeah. for me. I'll go with the 825, but I'm with you. I think of all the albums we've reviewed so far on this channel, this one took the longest for me mm -hmm. to kind of marinate on listen to a ton because I'm not a blues guy. I yeah. never heard this album. It came out two years before I was born and as I share all the time, we didn't have Apple Music or Spotify. There's no way to listen yeah. to these classics. I grew up in the as a music of the 80s guy yeah. and so I'd never heard any of this stuff. So yeah, it took a long time to get used mm. to the bluesies but once you do, you really do appreciate it for what it is. So 825 for me. Yeah, and I, I guess that is going to wrap it up That's it. from us today, man. Another good, great record from the Stones. Yeah. Looking forward to just uh, going chronologically. Sticky Fingers next. It's going to be a, a, a fun journey for sure. It's always fun to just experience new music that you've never listened to before. And uh, let us know, guys, below. Comment. What did you think of Let It Bleed? What's your favorite track? 
And uh, as, as I always say, be sure to hit that big red subscribe button. We upload twice a week in a variety of genres, so there's going to be something there for everybody. And um, as always, Sean, I appreciate you joining. I have a lot of fun. And uh, happy listening, my friends, and we will see you next time.